Hi, Miss Nikki here. Welcome to chapter 23, Digestion. You can see from these terms to the right, we're going to talk about the process of digestion. So we have ingestion where we're going to put the food in our mouth. And then we have mechanical breakdown. So think of this as physical breakdown if we're going to break the food apart with our teeth. One of the things that we have to remember is we're taking whole food and we're breaking it down into its individual components. So that should make you think about carbohydrates being broken down into individual sugars or proteins being broken down into amino acids, right? Um, nucleic acids being broken down into nucleotides. And then we can take all those pieces and parts, we can absorb them, and then we can create our own proteins and our own nucleic acids. And then obviously anything that we cannot digest is going to leave our system and we'll talk about defecation. One of the other things that we're going to talk about is mechanical digestion and chemical digestion. So when we get to the mouth, we're going to talk about how your teeth are breaking down the food mechanically into smaller parts, like tearing it apart. But then you also have salivary glands that are depositing enzymes that are going to chemically break down the food. And the same thing is going to happen in the stomach. We have both chemical and mechanical digestion. So looking at this image, it should make sense to you. We're going to take the food in. We're going to break it down to the nutrient molecules. We're going to absorb those molecules. And then we're going to get rid of any of the indigestible remains. So some more terms here when we talk about the digestive system, we also have to talk about the alimentary canal. So this is probably a new word for you. Alimentary canal is everything from the mouth to the anus. So it's a muscular tube that runs from the mouth to the anus. Um, we're going to see food digested and broken down into smaller fragments. We're going to absorb those fragments. And we're going to go through each of these um, steps here or organs that we would use in the digestive system. Um, alimentary canal, basically the tube within us, right? They say if you pull the alimentary canal out, you could line it up and it would be about eight meters. So if you think about an, a meter stick, that's quite a lot of tubing. Of course, we're going to have some digestive accessory organs, right? So the teeth, the tongue, the gallbladder, um, the, some of the salivary glands, uh, the liver, the pancreas, all of these things are going to kind of aid in the process of digestion. We have a nice view here, figure from your textbook, showing you the mouth, the tongue. Here are the salivary glands that I mentioned. We have the parotid, the sublingual, so underneath the tongue, and submandibular underneath the mandible. So usually the mandible would be blocking. You'd only be able to see a tiny part of the submandibular salivary gland. Then we have our esophagus. Esophagus leads to stomach. Stomach leads to small intestine. And we're going to talk about the duodenum, not duodenum, the jejunum, and the ilium. And see how this ilium is spelled. It's not like our hip bone ilium, it's ilium for intestines. So here we're at stomach. We go duodenum, real small duodenum. Then we lead into jejunum at the top. Then we lead into ilium. Then from ilium, we flow into the cecum, which is part of the large intestine. So you can see here, cecum. Then we go to ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon. Sigmoid colon has this S. Then we lead to rectum. Then we lead to anal canal and then anus. So review the six essential activities, ingestion, propulsion, mechanical, chemical digestion, absorption, and defecation. I would have an understanding of what each of those terms means, and then maybe think about the organs that are responsible for each of these actions. We also have to discuss these two terms, peristalsis and segmentation. We've talked about peristalsis before. We basically said alternating series of contractions, and you're usually moving away from, right? So this is, would be the mouth, um, the esophagus, right? So doing this kind of, you know, distal projection, moving the food by a series of alternating contractions. So this section contracts, the food moves down. Then the next section contracts and the food moves down. So they usually think of kind of longitudinal, north to south with peristalsis. With segmentation, you're doing more of a mixing. 
So segmentation is what we're going to see in the large intestines and the small intestines. And it's kind of visible from the stomach to the duodenum. We'll see that we have large food particles, large food particles where we have contraction happening both above and below. Sorry. So basically the above and below is contracting and that moves the food to two separate sections. So we've taken one piece and we've broken it up into two smaller pieces. And then we can break those smaller pieces up into even smaller pieces. So you see how this is alternating. This side contracts, then the next piece contracts, then the next piece contracts, and you're moving down. This, in segmentation, we have contraction happening above and below the food. And it's actually using the contraction to pull the food apart so that we can put more chemicals on the food and break it down to its simplest nutrients like sugars and amino acids and nu uh, nucleotides and fatty acid tails and things like that. So think of peristalsis, maybe food from the mouth to the stomach via the esophagus, and think of segmentation as small intestine, large intestine, where you're doing more of a circular contraction to pull food apart into smaller pieces. Now we get to talk about peritoneum, yay, right? So we've covered visceral and parietal serous membranes many times already, right? We've talked about them with the heart, uh, visceral and parietal pericardium. We've talked about them with the lungs, uh, visceral and parietal pleura. So now we have to talk about the peritoneum and the peritoneal cavity. So again, remember the visceral is going to touch the digestive organs and the parietal peritoneum is going to line the abdominal cavity wall. Um, what's interesting is we have this structure called the mesentery. So basically what happens in the abdominal cavity, the visceral and parietal peritoneum fuse back to back, but on the posterior side of the abdominal wall. And this provides uh, routes, like it says, for blood vessels, lymphatics, and nerves, and it also stores fat, right? So we're going to look at organs that are inside the peritoneum. Those are intraperitoneal organs. And then we're going to look at retroperitoneal organs. Those are located on the outside. And then I'm going to show you how the visceral and parietal peritoneum kind of fuse back to back and hold the intestines, kind of pinned the intestines to the posterior abdominal wall. You can see here the parietal peritoneum. Here you can see the visceral peritoneum because it's touching the organ, right? and the parietals touching the cavity wall, and they basically form this anchoring system. So where the visceral and the parietal fuse together, we're going to call that mesentery. So you can see here on the back side, they've labeled this as dorsal mesentery. And you can see how it anchors some of these alimentary canal organs. So let's just say intestines, right, for, for right now. So it kind of keeps them in place and seeing how they're doing segmentation, right? Seeing how they're constantly moving and churning food and doing mechanical digestion and absorption, we kind of want them to stay into place, right? So to me, it's almost like a suspension. It's, it's holding those um, alimentary organs in their place within the abdominal cavity. And of course, it gets a little more confusing because we have ventral mesentery as well. So here you can see the liver. So there are some um, organs. This would be an intraperitoneal organ. And it's also suspended by this fusion of the visceral and parietal peritoneum. So basically know the term mesentery and kind of think of it as an anchoring system. It's where parietal and visceral peritoneum is fused and it helps anchor alimentary canal organs. This is just another image from your textbook, giving you a few more details here. Uh, what I wanted to show you is here during development, some digestive organs are going to be retroperitoneal. They're going to lay outside of this peritoneal cavity. So kidneys are a good example of this. And then some of the uh, large intestines, some of the lower pelvic portions are also going to be retroperitoneal. We can also have inflammation of the peritoneum. Uh, this can be caused by some sort of wound that pierces the abdominal cavity wall. It could be an ulcer, a little stomach ulcer. It could be ruptured appendix. And this can be dangerous um, if it becomes widespread, right? Think if it's trapped within that 
um, intraperitoneal space that it's basically can, uh, the bacteria is infecting all of your digestive organs. The histology of the alimentary canal, we've seen this kind of structure before, these layers or tunica. Um, we always have an internal mucus layer, right? So this secretes mucus, digestive enzymes, hormones. Then we have a submucosal layer. This is going to be the connective tissue um, layer, and basically blood, lymphatics. Then you're going to have a muscular layer, and then you're going to have a serosa layer. So this is responsible for the visceral peritoneum. Um, usually on the outer, we have some sort of adventitia or fibrous. In this case, it's going to be visceral peritoneum. Here's a nice image from your textbook showing you the different layers here. So we can see that we have our mucosal layer, right? This is going to be our epithelium. Remember, we always have that internal epithelial layer. So then if our internal layer is epithelial and it's secreting mucus, then we have to have a submucosal layer that's connective tissue, right? So here's the connective tissue, submucosal layer. Remember, this is where we're going to have lymphatics and blood vessels and all that good stuff. What I want you to see with the muscle layers is, can you see how these are kind of longitudinal, running north to south? And then these are the circular muscles that are running east to west. So these circular muscles would help us with segmentation, where these uh, longitudinal muscles would, uh, smooth muscle would help us with uh, peristalsis. You can also see the outer layer, which is the serous layer. So they list it over here serous layer remember this is your visceral peritoneum and that's going to fuse with the parietal peritoneum and form that mesentery or that rope-like structure we were talking about we have to talk about splint neck circulation basically these are the branches that come off of the abdominal aorta and they're going to serve the digestive organs so this line right here hepatic splenic and gastric all three of these arteries come off of something called the celiac trunk that i'll show you in the next image so hepatic is going to lead to the liver, splenic to the spleen, gastric to the stomach. Also coming off of the abdominal aorta, you have inferior and superior mesenteric arteries. These are going to feed the large and the small intestines. I also want you to remember that we have this hepatic portal circulation. So basically anything draining from the large and small intestines, right? So venous blood from the large and small intestines, from the stomach, and from the spleen, are all going to drain into hepatic portal and be processed by the liver before we put them back into the inferior vena cava. Here's the celiac trunk I was talking about. Some people say celiac artery, the book says celiac trunk. So here's your celiac trunk and we can see the first branch is going to feed the stomach and says gastric artery. We're not going to worry so much about left and right gastric artery, just gastric artery feeding the stomach. And then we can see another branch comes off and it makes this little squiggly and it goes all the way out to the spleen. That would be the splenic artery. And then over here we have the hepatic artery. And the hepatic artery is delivering oxygenated blood to the liver. Here we can see, let me get my little mouse, there it is. Here we can see the superior mesenteric artery. And you're blocked from seeing where it comes off of the aorta, but I'll show you in the next image. So here's superior mesenteric artery. That's going to feed the intestines. And then lower, you're going to have an inferior mesenteric artery. So if I said name the three branches off of the celiac, you're going to say the celiac comes, celiac trunk comes off of the abdominal aorta. It branches into gastric, splenic, and hepatic arteries. We have a nice image here. We've removed all of the organs so that you can see all of the branches off of the abdominal aorta. So here we're going to start with our celiac trunk. Remember our celiac trunk is going to have an artery that comes off, which is the gastric artery. We're going to have another artery that comes off, which is the splenic artery. We're going to have another artery that comes off, which is the hepatic artery. Then if I move down to the next section here, I have this branch off the abdominal aorta. That's my superior mesenteric artery. And then if I come down a little bit farther, here's the smaller inferior mesenteric artery. So you can notice some of these other branches that we've talked about, this one specifically, right? Gonadal artery. So here's the gonadal arteries coming off. And then this one's pretty easy to see. We can see the renal arteries coming off. And we'll come back and talk about those when we get to the urinary system.
So the gastrointestinal tract has its own nervous system. We call this the enteric nervous system. There's lots of neurons here, more than are in the spinal cord. They're going to help the GI tract uh, wall control movement, right? So smooth muscle direction is going to be involved. Um, they can regulate whether the gr glands are going to secrete a lot of mucus or a little. Um, so basically your um, gut can kind of think for itself. Is it still controlled or influenced by your central nervous system? Yes. Your parasympathetic system can enhance the digestive process. Um, remember, parasympathetic is rest and digest. So this is the one that's the most active during the digestive process. Sympathetic, that's your fight or flight. That's usually going to inhibit digestion. If you're trying to run, we don't want to waste the blood and the energy to try to break down food, right? So they have this nice figure in your textbook showing you that you can have external stimuli and that can be picked up by your central nervous system. So you smell a steak on the grill, right? Why does your stomach start rumbling? Um, it's because that external stimuli triggered your central nervous system and your central nervous system sent impulses to your nerve plexus, right? Your enteric nervous system. And that started the smooth muscles contracting or maybe glands secreting mucus, getting ready to consume food, kind of like priming your system. But you can also have internal stimuli directly to the enteric nervous system. So what happens as soon as you drop food into your stomach, it's going to start the digestive process, right? So they want you to see that mechanoreceptors and chemoreceptors are located in the walls of the gastrointestinal tract and they respond to stretch. That would be the mechanoreceptor, right? A chemoreceptor would be a chemical, yes. So your if you were to drop food into your stomach, it's going to stimulate this specific reflex, right? That's going to be to activate digestive glands, produce more mucus, start the smooth muscle mixing and moving the contents around. Again, they want to point out that you have two different controls here. So intrinsically, you have your enteric nervous system doing what it's supposed to do, but that the enteric nervous system or the di control of digestive activity can also be um, increased or decreased by external controls, which would be your central nervous system. So another way you could think of this, if you've ever had a really bad breakup or you uh, you've had something very stressful going on, maybe you're not consuming food. Maybe your appetite is gone. You don't feel like eating. So that is your central nervous system taking over control of your digestive activity. Also think about the fact that we have hormones in the stomach um, and in the small intestine that are going to be released that can stimulate target cells. So there's also a hormonal control here as well as a, a nervous system control. The mouth is where food is going to be chewed and mixed. We also have saliva. So we'll come back and talk about the salivary glands. They have enzymes or they're secreting enzymes in your saliva. And that's going to start the process of chemical breakdown or digestion as soon as the food is put into your mouth. We're also going to talk about swallowing. All of this is going to happen in the oral cavity or the buccal cavity or buccal cavity. And we have some terms here that you should know. Uh, we'll talk about the frenulum. This is the attachment points from the lip to the gum. Also remember that your mouth is stratified squamous epithelium. So why is this good? It's for protection, right? Stratified abrasion protection. Epithelium, this doesn't have its own blood supply, right? The connective tissue underneath is what supplies blood to the epithelial tissue. So this is a good abrasion protection. And think about any time you consume food, some of your stratified squamous epithelium is coming off and mixing with your food. Nice image here. You can see the frenulum. There's a superior and an inferior where the lip is attached to the gum. You can also see the openings of some of the uh, salivary glands. So here's the submandibular salivary gland duct. And then over here, we have the sublingual ducts from the salivary glands there. You can see the uvula hanging down. You can see the tongue. And you can see how the tongue is attached to the gums as well. This is the lingual frenulum. Some terms we've talked about, uh, hard palate, soft palate. So hard palate would be palatine bone. 
the roof of your mouth, right? And then we have the soft palate. This is going to be mostly skeletal muscle and hanging off, you're going to have the uvula. So what's good about the hard palate is this helps create friction. So the tongue is going to push the food around in the mouth and you kind of spread it out on your hard palate. You can see in this image, your tongue, right? When you're chewing the food, your teeth are tearing it, but your tongue is also mashing it against the hard palate and creating something called a bolus. Uh, real quick, make sure that you can follow the kind of the pathway of food. So if you put the food in your mouth, right, it's in your oral cavity, then we move back here to our oropharynx, and then we move into our laryngeal pharynx. Hopefully this epiglottis flap closes and we divert the food into our esophagus, not into our trachea point I was trying to make earlier is that the tongue is doing kind of this mechanical repositioning and mixing of food while you're chewing. So your teeth are tearing the food apart, but your tongue is kind of moving it around and mixing it and breaking it into smaller pieces. So the tongue is responsible for swallowing or initiating swallowing by pushing the food back into the oropharynx. It's also responsible for speech, also for taste, right? Way back in 201 when we talked about special senses. Um, so there's a lot kind of going on with the tongue. What we're going to form is something called the bolus. So you put the food in your mouth, your teeth are chewing it, your salivary glands are dumping chemicals on it, and your tongue is repositioning and mixing the food in your mouth and then initiating the swallowing. So a lot going on here. So here are the taste buds. We've talked about these back in 201. We have the circumvallate papillae taste buds. We have the papillae on the tongue. These are the ones that usually detect like smooth or crunchy. So your salivary glands are secreting saliva and this saliva is doing a lot, right? So it's beginning the breakdown of starches. So the amylase, um, this is the enzyme that's gonna initiate the breakdown of carbohydrates as soon as you put them in your mouth. It's also going to moisten your food. It's gonna help create that compact bolus that we're gonna push into the oropharynx. Um, salivary glands are going to have both serous membranes and mucous membranes. So if you've ever had that sensation of like my mouth is watering because maybe I smell food, that's going to be the serous cells that are secreting serous fluid watery. If you ever had dry mouth, like you, oh my God, I'm really thirsty. I need some water. And you feel another nice image from your book. We can see the parotid salivary gland. Remember it's sitting on top of that masseter muscle. You can see the submandibular, it kind of forms this U shape. If the mandible was here, you'd only be able to see the bottom part of it. And then here we can see the sublingual salivary gland underneath the tongue. So what's the composition of saliva? It's mostly water. It's slightly acidic. You're going to have lots of electrolytes in it, like sodium and potassium, right? Phosphates, bicarbonate. You're going to have um, enzymes such as salivary salivary amylases. Ooh, say that a couple times, right? <laughs> salivary amylases and lingual lipases. So you should be able to look at these terms and, and recognize what they do. So if it's an amylase, it's breaking down starch. What is starch? It's a complex carbohydrate. What is a lipase? That's an enzyme that breaks down lipids. So as soon as you put something in your mouth, the saliva starts breaking down the complex carbohydrates and the fats. Um, there's also going to be some metabolic waste, some urea and uric acid. These are from the breakdown of proteins and nucleic acids. You're also going to have lysozymes. You're going to have some IgA. You're going to have defensins. All of these things are going to help um, kind of fight off any uh, pathogens that are there, right? These are immune, immune type responses. So the your saliva actually helps keep your mouth clean and not overrun by microorganisms. I'm not going to go too much into teeth. I want to talk just about a few things uh, and then the location of them, obviously, in the mouth and that they're helping with the mechanical breakdown. You should know this term mastication. So this is the process of chewing that uh, tears and grinds the food into smaller segments. So remember, we want to start with a large segment. We want to break it down into smaller segments. And then we want to dump the enzymes on those smaller segments and then pull apart till we get those nutrient molecules, those individual glucoses or the individual amino acids or the individual um, 
nucleotides from the nucleic acids so that we can absorb just those tiny molecules, right? So we do have something called deciduous teeth. Some people call them baby teeth or milk teeth. We're not doing a lot of uh, heavy breakdown of food between six months and, and two years, right? We're eating more soft foods. Um, so these teeth are not permanent teeth. They're deciduous. They're going to fall out. And then eventually you will have permanent teeth. So these are going to have uh, roots, right? They're, um, when the permanent teeth start erupting from below, they're going to push the deciduous or the baby teeth out. We also have third molars. Uh, some people call these wisdom teeth. Usually between the ages of 17 and 25, these third molars come in. Um, sometimes they're a pain, but this is just the evolution of better health care for our teeth, right? So before, why would you get third molars later on in life? Well, you might have actually ground down your first and second molars. So this was an extra set of teeth that you would have to get you through the second half of your life, right? When life expectancy was maybe 40. So we know we have incisors, we have canines, we have premolars and molars, right? So these are the different types of teeth classified according to their shape. And the shape usually tells you kind of what their function is. So incisors, cutting, uh, canines, tearing or piercing, uh, molars are going to be kind of to grind, to grind, right? That's kind of, or crush maybe. From this image in your book, you can see the incisors are towards the front here. And then we have our canines, and then we move to premolars, and then back here to regular molars. I wanted to just look at kind of the structures that make up your teeth. I wanted you to see the enamel. So the enamel is the outer covering of the tooth. This is made with the same bone material that our bones would be made out of, that hydroxyapatite. Right, so that uh, hardened material that we use to make bones, that calcium phosphate, that is the same material as enamel and dentin. One of the things that I need to make clear though is it is not the same as bone. So your teeth are not bone, they're just made from the same material. So what's different about bone? What's different about the socket that your tooth sits in? Do you remember that bone is metabolically active? You can build bone, you can break down bone, you always have those stem cells that are there. You do not have that with your teeth. So if your enamel and your dentin starts breaking down, there is no way to fix that or regenerate that. Basically, you'd have to remove the tooth and put in a fake tooth, right? So not the same, but made with the same material. And I just wanted to show you the enamels, the outer coating, the dentin is kind of everything here in blue. And then you can see in this pulp cavity, this is where we have the blood vessels and the nerves. So basically, if you chip a tooth, if you had an opening here, you chipped through the enamel and through the dentin and your nerve was exposed, that's where that pain comes in from toothache. So sometimes if this pulp cavity gets damaged or the nerves and the blood vessels start um, dying, we have to go in and do a root canal. And basically they're just digging all that material out so that it doesn't become infected. Another thing to look at here, the periodontal ligament. This is something else that we have to be careful with because as we get older, right, if we're not maintaining proper health care, so let's say we have bacteria here and the bacteria wedge their way between your teeth and your gum, and then the bacteria start multiplying, and they start leaving their excrement, that's plaque, and if that starts blocking or destroying the periodontal ligament, then your teeth get loose and then they fall out. So if you aren't flossing, I suggest you start flossing and keep this nice and clean instead of being filled with bacterial poop, which is what causes plaque. So if bacterial poop wasn't enough to make you take care of your teeth, if you neglect your gums, it can escalate to disease. You can destroy the periodontal ligament. Come down to here. What happens? Your teeth, they say, the health of your teeth is a direct indication of the health of your heart. So if you have more plaque formation, you're more likely, and more plaque formation in your mouth, you're more likely to have more plaque formation in your arteries. Bacteria can enter the blood, they can cause clot formation, and they can initiate stroke.
And then if you compound this with smoking or diabetes or oral piercings, right? More bacteria getting into tissue that they shouldn't be getting into, like connective tissue with a direct blood supply. So there've been a lot of articles linking periodontal disease to increased heart disease and stroke. Here's the last slide for this part. This is basically just a summary. So after every digestive process or organ that we talk about, I'll have kind of a summary slide. You probably need to know a little bit more than what's on here or have a good idea of what each of these terms mean. So I haven't explained ingestion, right? You've got to tell me something about taking food in, right? So that you can add a little bit more to this, but this is kind of just the summary. What is the mouth doing? Well, it's the area that we take the food in, do ingestion. We do mechanical digestion. So we have our teeth, which are chewing and tearing the food apart. We have our tongue, which is moving the food around in our mouth, right? We're doing mastication, chewing. Um, we have saliva that's doing chemical digestion and make sure you understand the two things that we're breaking down immediately with saliva. We're breaking down carbohydrates, good, and lipids, good. So amylase is breaking down carbohydrates and lipase is breaking down lipids. Um, and then we have to move the food. So we're going to use the tongue in the mouth to move the food to the pharynx and that's propulsion. And then we have something called swallowing or deglutition. So that's the fancy word. Mastication is the fancy word for chewing. Deglutition is the fancy word for swallowing. And we'll talk about this mechanism in a little more detail in just a few slides.